feel I'd be remiss if I didn't take just a moment to express my appreciation for the invitation to come and be with you this week. I'm looking forward to it, and I hope and pray you'll be benefited and profited by the things we have to say and look at from God's Word. Uh, as has already been noted, we're going to be looking at the idea of God-centered and not man-focused. I've got a, a few graphics here to kind of help us with this idea and thought. I hope and pray that you'll note that as we kind of look at this, uh, when I think about God-centered, I was trying to think about different pictures that might help us appreciate this idea. And so this one kind of stood out to me. Here you have the clouds, you have these steps that lead up to heaven, you have this light that represents the idea of heaven and God reigning and ruling from heaven. So the idea of being God-centered sort of focuses our attention upon this idea to give us this understanding and appreciation that that's what we need to be is God-centered. As noted and Jerry pointed out, there's in this world today a lot of attention to man and being focused upon man, man's needs, man's desires, man's wants. And uh, it strikes me that as we kind of look at life and kind of think about different aspects of this, that really you can kind of condense it down to this idea we're either God-centered or we're man-focused. I know that sounds a little simplistic, but I'm fully persuaded that as you consider the subject, that really it does come down to the simple proposition. We're either going to be one or the other. And as we think about this idea of being God-centered as opposed to man-focused, I want to think about it from a standpoint of the Bible. We're going to start our study then with the idea of the Bible, our focus upon the Bible. And let me go ahead and affirm this to you and kind of think about it from this perspective. The Bible is God-centered and not man-focused. By its very nature, that's the case. When you look, for example, at the idea of the Bible and the scriptures, and you start thinking about the Bible, and, and in fact, as we pick up the Bible, and you hold the Bible in your hand, of course, anymore, I have to kind of pause for a second. I know some people use electronic devices. Yeah, you see people out there, and in fact, we've had individuals come up to do the scripture reading, and they'll walk up there with their device, and they'll start punching the device in and have their information. I, I'm, I guess I'm old-fashioned. I have a difficult time with some of those devices anyway, under the best of circumstances. I'm kind of technologically challenged, if you will, and so I'm kind of impressed when people can do that sort of thing. And they get up there and they begin to I'm looking out in the audience, and I'm sure Jerry sees the same type of thing. You see individuals, instead of the Bible being opened up, they have their devices. I'm sure they're following along with us, Jerry, when they're doing that sort of thing and not checking out the emails or other situations of which they may have a game or something like that. But the Bible, when you take the Bible, and of course it's God's Word. That's what we're talking about. When you take the Bible and you start looking at the Bible and somebody asks you, what is the Bible? How would you describe it? What would be your explanation to somebody about the Bible? And as you think about the Bible, and many times we focus upon the idea of a number of stories, the accounts that are in the Bible, and that's appropriate, proper. They're certainly found therein. We think about the Bible and the fact that it's 66 books, 40-plus writers over a 1,500-year period, varied backgrounds, setting forth these scriptures, the Old and New Testaments, the Old Testament, of 66 books, 39 Old, 27 New Testament. So we begin to talk about it. We're trying to kind of give an explanation of the scriptures in the Bible. And what the Bible is, is God's mind revealed to us. That's the key ingredient. It's God's mind. He's told us things. He's given us information. And the Bible is, by its very nature, God-centered. As you look a little bit additionally with this, let me note that kind of to illustrate the principle further, the Bible begins with God and ends with God. In Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, we're familiar with that verse. It's appropriate that the Bible begins from that perspective and at that point in time. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the focus is upon God. This God-centeredness is observable in the scriptures. When we look at the last part, of the Bible, when we close out the scriptures, you know, Genesis to Revelation, we note there in the 20, uh, 22nd chapter, verses 20 and 21, he who testifies to those things says, surely I'm coming quickly, amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, amen. So at the very end, what's the focal point? The Lord Jesus. Now, I'm persuaded that in this particular instance, the coming quickly 
has reference to the judgment of the Lord upon those individuals who are persecuting the church. And that's what the focus of victory in Christ is observable here in the book of Revelation. That's the theme, the idea. And that those under great persecution can rely upon the Lord, trust in him. And even though you have to go through trials and troubles and tribulations in this life, the Lord will be with you. And the final victory will be found in Christ. You'll have that victory. Of course, the same principle is applicable, though, the idea that the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. That that's an ongoing, continuing idea that we should all take reassurance in and be comforted by. And that the idea, is, again, in extending it to the final judgment, don't we want the Lord to come? Aren't we anxious for the Lord to appear? Isn't that exciting to think about the Lord coming again and this earth ending as it currently exists and we can be in heaven for an eternity with the Heavenly Father, with God, the Lord Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, with all the saved throughout the eons of time. Isn't that a wonderful thing to reflect upon that and the idea of that taking place? Come quickly, Lord. Shouldn't we be able to say that today? Shouldn't we desire that, the Lord to come quickly? So the Bible begins with God. It ends with God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And everything in between still centers upon God. Again, let me sort of illustrate that by looking at some aspects from a standpoint of graphics. If you start going through the Bible, there's a whole lot of individuals we're acquainted with, people that we read about uh, that immediately come to mind if you start talking about various ones and scriptures. Uh, some of these, I've just taken a few to kind of focus upon to give us a, this idea behind it. But you begin with Adam and Eve, the first man, the first woman, God creating Adam, then creating Eve to be the help meet for Adam. Uh, you go to Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. All these are familiar names to us that are Bible students. Joseph and Moses and Joshua and David and Solomon, covering then the, uh, a long period of time that starts in the book of Genesis, carries us over into the book of Exodus, takes us into the time period of the establishment of the nation of Israel, and taking us point to the point then of the period of the United Kingdom and the kings ruling over the nations. But as you think about all these different individuals and as you think about those people we talk about and discuss and in our Bible classes, at the very early stages, they begin to learn about the stories and the people of the Bible. The very heart of it is still God. And we never should overlook the fact that when we're telling others and teaching about these individuals in our Bible classes, about Adam and Eve and Noah, that it always has to be first and foremost to be appreciated the fact that God is in the center of it all. And so as you start thinking about this and begin to add other names, Elijah, Elisha, Joshua, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, uh, as you begin to look at these individuals, they start fading from the screen. Those individuals we already talked about, we move on chronologically through the Bible, don't we? To other names, to other people, to other events that are described. Come to the New Testament, and there's Joseph and Mary. And, of course, Mary, the virgin birth of Jesus. I have highlighted Jesus because, of course, Jesus is God in the flesh. And so we want to designate Jesus in that way and be appreciative of the fact that he's God. But here he comes to earth, robed in the flesh, as we read about in John chapter 1. And as he comes to this earth in order to fulfill the purpose of redeeming us from our sins, we have that accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that tell us about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and all that he did for us and how much we should be appreciative of what he's done on our behalf. But so you have these individuals, and then you come to Peter and Andrew. And again, you think about others, James and John, Mary and Martha, Paul. You have Barnabas, Stephen, Philip, Timothy, Titus. What other names immediately come to your mind of individuals that we read about in the Scriptures that we're appreciative of their great faith and the work that they did? And as you, as you look at these individuals, we still talk about them. We still are appreciative of them. We still acknowledge them and learn and glean from them because of what the Bible points out regarding their lives. But, again, they fade from view as it relates to this earth and this life. But the one consistency throughout the scriptures is God. He's consistently present. One of the things, just as an aside that's a, sort of a humbling reality, is to come to the realization of how insignificant we truly are. You know, when, when we think about God, 
God-centeredness and being not man-focused, I, I think that we need to acknowledge that we are truly insignificant and not important. We sometimes have a high opinion of ourselves. I think that's somewhat natural, but we have to be careful and on guard about that. Because we start thinking, you know, if I'm not around, what's going to happen to the people over here and to the Lord's Church and think about all the important activities I, I'm engaged in, think about all the great work I've accomplished, or all these types of things. You start having that in your mind and about everything that you're doing. And, of course, we want to be active. We want to be involved. We want to be fulfilling our obligations and responsibilities. But we have to be careful not to think that I'm indispensable because none of us are. We are on this earth for just a short period of time. This is vapor that comes and then vanishes away. And you know what? The Lord's church, after the establishment of the Lord's church in Acts chapter 2, it's been in existence for all that period of time. And when I'm gone from this earth, when I'm no longer around, as long as the Lord has not yet returned, the church will still be in existence. There will still be those following him. There will be those that would adhere to his will. And I don't have to be present in order to do that. Now, while I'm here, I need to be active. I need to be involved. I need to be doing my part. But I'm not indispensable. You know, that's a humbling reality, to be appreciative of the idea that I'm, within the scope of all these things, I'm just passing through. My time is very short. And when it's all said and done, when I'm gone, others will carry on. The one consistency throughout all things is God. And that helps us be God-centered, to be understanding of that principle and that idea. So here you have the thought, and here's God before us. So God-centered Bible. While it's true that we can know some things about the Lord from observation in nature, and of course a couple of verses of Scripture readily come to mind, the psalmist had to say in the 14th chapter in verse 1, the fool says in his heart there is no God. So an individual who doesn't acknowledge God is a fool. The fool says in his heart there is no God. In the 19th chapter in verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God in the firmament of his handiwork. We can look around us and observe some things about that there has to be something greater than ourselves. It seems self-evident, does it not? Axiomatic that there has to be something greater than ourselves. When we consider the idea of the fact that we're here, that we can reason and think, there's logic, that we look about us and the universe shows design, so there's a designer, the architecture of the universe, and so there's an architect behind it. We, we look at those types of ideas. There's something greater than ourselves. But now let me ask you this, just noting the fact that there's something around us, and as we begin to observe this, and we begin to recognize this idea, just as a logical uh, outcome of the realization of who we are and the fact that all these things take place around about us, and we can reason and think through these matters logically, then what is the nature of that one? What do we know about God? Well, I can tell you we can tell that from nature that he's powerful, can't we? We can observe that. But there's a lot that I would not know save for the fact that he tells me about himself. It's only in the Bible that God has completely revealed himself to us. Well, I want to know about God, where do I go? What's the source of that information about his nature, his being, his attributes? Well, I have to go to the Bible, don't I? The scriptures, that's his mind revealed to us. He tells us this information that we need to know. There are things that I would be clueless about, save the fact that he's told me about these matters, including why I'm here. What's my purpose for being here? You start going through all this different aspects associated with it, and the great important questions of life are all revealed in the Bible. And without that, I would be clueless. I'd be adrift trying to ascertain certain matters that I might try to wrestle with, but I still couldn't really come to understand to be appreciative of. That's why all these philosophers and people have always wondered and had these questions, and that's why they begin to devise different ways to try to give explanations, and they always are wanting. They always fall short. They are never satisfying. The Bible provides all of those answers, all that information. Now, so you think about it's only in the Bible that God has revealed himself completely, fully, sufficiently to us. Now, let me think about this with you for a moment. Example, how do we know about God's mercy and how it's manifested? Again, there may be some things that we can sort of conclude and rationally be able to ascertain by the fact that because God sends the rain, the sunshine, we have 
the food that he's provided so we can get some aspects of his being as a consequence of that. But it's not really going to be full or complete, is it? We're not going to be able to really delve into it extensively because there's just not enough information just from observation. So it's an observation of scriptures that we can really know about God's love, the manifestation of his mercy. Well, obviously we would conclude and understand that it has to be from his word, what he's revealed to us. So you think about John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. One of the most familiar verses, if not the most familiar verse of the Bible. I can still remember in times past, I don't think I've seen this recently, but you'd be watching some sporting event, a football game, for example, and as they're about to kick the uh, extra point or a field goal, and so they have that camera view, and it's up looking toward the goal post, and in the stands behind somebody that have a banner up there, John 3.16. Uh, so this, this banner that one would see, that was pretty often the case that you would observe that. So John 3.16, go to the Bible. For God so loved the world. Well, what was the manifestation of his great love? It was Jesus Christ coming to this earth. I feel like Romans, the fifth chapter, is really a commentary on John 3.16. It gives us an appreciation of that love. And it describes that love in a way that, again, is humbling. I want to take just a moment to open up the Bible with you and read these verses together so that we can kind of ponder this idea of the great love of God, its manifestation. And as we consider this, again, there's a very humbling realization associated with what's described here. Um, and the Bible tells us something that we would not know otherwise. So if we pick up the reading in Romans, the fifth chapter, in verse 6, for when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved through wrath, from wrath through him. For when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received the reconciliation. How much did God love us? He sent his son to die for us. How deserving were we of that death? Not at all. Not one whit. He came when we we're unworthy and undeserving to have what God extended to us. And that's where his mercy is demonstrable. That's the extent of what we find being described in Scripture. So John 3.16, as you look at what's noted here in Romans chapter 5, helps elaborate upon the fact of that great love that he sent his son because we weren't worthy of his death, never have been, never will be. But he loved us so much. We're created in his image after his likeness. We have an eternal spirit. And God, after sin had entered into the world and because of our own sins... We were in need of a redeemer, a savior, and it required, and you know, sin is so reprehensible that it required the very blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, for our redemption. That's how awful and terrible, repugnant sin is. And the Bible informs us of that. And so once we understand that, why would we not humbly be obedient to him in all things? He's done so much for us and things we cannot do for ourselves. And here is described in the scripture, the wonderful love of God, his mercy. And then think about Hebrews 5 and verse 9. Having been perfected, he becomes the author of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. You know, there's always a qualifying aspect to these matters pertaining to the love of God. He's extended his love to all, but not everybody will be a recipient of that love. He gave Jesus Christ for everyone, but not everybody is going to be able to be benefited by that great sacrifice. We have to be obedient to him. And these are all information that is provided for us that can only be given or only available to us through the written word. What we contain to have today from the scriptures, the mind of God revealed to us. So with those thoughts in mind, that's the introduction. Uh, don't worry, I, I don't want to overly concern. I do have a watch up here. I borrowed it from my mother-in-law. I noticed y'all don't have a clock on the wall. And 
I had forgotten about that, and then I, I thought I'd recalled something about that, so she was very good enough to loan me this. I also understand that I'm going to be given some signals about the time period in which we're going to be uh, needing to kind of shut this down. So when I say introduction, I don't want you to be overly concerned about it. I, uh, the last place I held a gospel meeting, I was up and I couldn't recall just how long the time period for the Bible class was, so I'm going through the material. So I asked the preacher there about, you know, how much longer I had and everything. He said, oh, don't worry about it. Just take all the time you need it. I don't know if he understood what he was saying when he said that. So I was still aware of it, and we, we still shut it down in time. So I don't want to get people overly concerned about those matters. But as, 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 we, as we look at these matters, that idea, I wanted to lay the groundwork for everything that follows. So what is our disposition toward the Bible? What is going to be our attitude toward the Scriptures and the approach that we take toward it? Well, as we delve into this, I want us to be understanding of the idea of how we're going to look at the scriptures, how we approach the Bible, and what we need to be doing as it relates to the Word of God. Well, we need to read it. It sounds rather fundamental, doesn't it? But we have to read it. I have to become acquainted with it. So when Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.13, among the things he says, give attention to reading. You know, they had the scriptures, the scrolls at that time, information available and give, give attention to the reading. I understand that there was, during this period of time, the oral communication, the Holy Spirit giving revelation through individuals who communicated it orally. Then we see that they were instructed and guided the Holy Spirit, so they wrote down these truths that we have now in written form. But they still had scriptures that give attention to reading. When you turn over to Ephesians, the third chapter, when Paul is writing about the mystery that was given to him, he, he's describing this, and this is this idea of that which is being set forth in writing. Of course, Ephesians, a letter that was written to the Ephesian brethren that we have to give us that instructions that we need today. What was written to them is for us as well. And so if you look at the third chapter, verses 3 and 4, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I've briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. These things are written down. The, the, this mystery, it's no, the mystery is something that's not known, and now it's going to be revealed. The mystery solved. I've given you this information, and now you can read about these things, that you may have the knowledge of the mystery of Christ, that this is now available to you. So that mystery that's being revealed. So you read. You take the book, you open up the book, you read the book. Now, how often do we read our Bibles or electronic devices that have the Bible on it? How often we just take the Bible, open it up, and read it? Just maybe a systematic approach to it. You know, you have some type of uh, way in which to read the Bible through in a year. I know there's several of those that are available, but you don't have to do it that way. There's other types of approaches you can take. Maybe you're reading it for preparation for other uh, studies and Bible classes, but how often we just take the Bible and read it? Ever thought about instances where people have Bibles? You know, we are very blessed to have the Bibles available to us. Uh, printing presses came into being, and now we have ways to mass produce it. Before, it was had, had to be very meticulously handwritten. These scribes had to go through all of this ordeal in order to make sure that they copied correctly. And so the scriptures and the scrolls were very precious. They were, they were hard to come by. Now we can go into a house and you may have several Bibles in your home. I've got down in my library a number of, of different translations of the Bible, some of them just for purposes of being able to go and refer to them. So you've got numerous Bibles in, in your houses, and then you go over to the bookshelf and you pull it out and you have to brush it off because of the dust that's gathered on it. People have that type of attitude. Here's God's mind revealed to us, and we don't even take it and open up and read it regularly. So the first order of business is to read it. And then we study it. Reading is the beginning point, but that's not the end. We also have to study, and that's giving careful, thoughtful consideration to what's being set forth there, to go through systematically, to reflect upon what's being set in scriptures that have been written down so that I can come to a further understanding. And, realization of what's being actually set forth. And so study 
requires diligence. In fact, in 2 Timothy 2.15, another passage that we're very familiar with, the old King James says, study to show yourself approved in God of workmen, which needs not to be ashamed. The other translations, including the new King James, says give diligence to show yourself approved in God, the workman which needs not to be ashamed. Handling aright the word of God. The idea of the diligence and study, I think diligence kind of uh, gives us the appreciation of what's necessary and needful and the consequences associated with the study. To give that diligence is the effort that's needed. The exertion that's required in order to go in and really to be able to acknowledge it through our efforts what is being set forth in the Word of God. So the study that has to be put forth to handle it right. If I'm going to handle it right, I'm going to have to study it. I'm going to have to go about the task of examining it carefully and in a systematic way. Again, numerous manners and means that can be utilized in order to have a systematic study, uh, ways in which we can delve into it and be profited by it. But it requires us to do it, and it gives necessarily diligence associated with it in order to accomplish that. In Acts 17, 11, talking about those Bereans, they were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they searched the scriptures daily to see what was in it. So they read it, and they searched it out. They sought out to see these things. Now, it's kind of interesting, just as you look at the context, here comes Paul in amongst them, and he's able to do miracles, and he's teaching, and and setting forth these truths and telling them about Jesus Christ. So what was it that they were searching out? Well, they had those scrolls we talked about, what we refer to as the Old Testament. So when Paul would talk about the prophecies being fulfilled, they'd go back and examine the prophecies to see if those prophecies that were stated in the fulfillment of them in Jesus as Paul was describing it. So they studied the matter. They weren't content just to have Paul tell them something. They wanted to go back and look at it. And let me tell you something. Throughout the course of this week, if I say something you don't agree with, I would welcome you to come to me. You'd be my friend, brother and sister in Christ. If I'm mistaken about something, I want to treat, teach only what's true and what's right. And so as a consequence of that, I count you as one that is having my best interest at heart to come and talk to me about something that you believe I'm saying is wrong. We need to study God's word. And you should never take a person's word for it. You need to go to the source, and that's the Bible. I always want people to go back and look to see what I'm saying if it's true to the word. So we study it. We meditate on it. That's always struck me as an interesting aspect associated because we think about it. That's what meditation is. It's thinking about it. We studied it after having read it. We studied it. And now we, we have time in which we ponder it. We think about it. The psalmist said, Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. It gives us then an appreciation for his recognition of the importance of God's word, doesn't it? How I love your law. You know, if we have that kind of love, uh, desire to know these truths, uh, we'll, we'll be about the task of reading it and studying it like we should. And then we'll think about it. We'll just reflect upon it. And, and as we reflect upon it, it helps us understand matters. And, and we associate truths together. We're able to kind of look at things in a way that helps us be more fully cognizant of what's taking place in, in God's word. So you think about it. You meditate upon it. The psalmist also, in Psalms chapter 1, when in the second chapter, talking about the same idea of meditating upon the word, we first have the idea of blessed is the man who walks, in verse 1, not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of the sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Contrasted with that is, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. His delight, oh, how I love your, thy law, in his law, he meditates day and night. We think about it often, frequently, thinking about the word of God. Why? Because that's God revealing his will to us, and we reflect upon it. We meditate upon it. We also find that as we consider these scriptures, to apply it. In 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture inspired of God, God breathed, Profitable for what? Doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction, righteousness, the man of God may be what? Perfectly, thoroughly furnished into all good works. We apply it. We're not content just to read it, which we need to do in order to know it. We need to study it so we can delve into it more extensively, so we can glean from it those truths that are revealed. We need to meditate upon it, thinking about it. And part of that meditation is how we apply it properly to our life. You know, before I look at the last one, do you ever wonder why the Bible is written the way that it is? 
and let me kind of help us sort of think about it from this perspective. Wouldn't it have been a lot easier if God would have just given us a whole bunch of lists there of do's and don'ts? You got your do's on one side, you got your don'ts on the other side, and you can go down the checklist, right? Okay, I'm doing, 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 and I'm not doing these things that are wrong, and so we can check list it off, and we just kind of memorize the list. Maybe a pretty extensive list, so maybe I have to go and look at it periodically and reflect upon it from that standpoint. But I can go down the checklist, kind of like the pilot getting into the plane. He's got his checklist there. He goes through his routine, so he doesn't overlook anything. So you got your checklist that you mark off. So wouldn't that have been a lot simpler, a lot easier, if we just had that kind of approach that God would have given, and he just had the checklist? And now you go to the to the Bible and you begin to look and say, you know, there's some, there's some things. There's the milk of the word. There's the meat of the word. There's things that are challenging. And, 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 and you're looking at this thing and begin to scratch your head about some areas that we're studying and, and looking at and trying to ascertain what, what's set forth there. Let me suggest to you, uh, the Bible doesn't tell us why it's written the way that it is. It's unfolded over the course of time. You have the New Testament and the information. But I'm fully persuaded after all the years of studying God's Word, looking at it, and having to roll up my sleeves, and like all of us, wrestle with some aspects of it, still have to delve into it more extensively. You know what? The reason it's written the way that it is and the challenges, it's not that the milk of the Word is easily understood. We understand what we need to do to be saved. We understand the fundamentals that are set forth. They're simply set in a way that we can take it and grasp it, but there's that meatiness that's associated with it that we constantly and continuously are having to delve into the reason why is because God doesn't want lazy Christians. In fact, you can't be a Christian and be lazy. If you had a checklist, you just go through the checklist. God requires us to be active and diligent. We have to be delving into it. We have to work at it. God <laughs> wants us to continue to grow spiritually, and that demands constant effort on our part. So the Bible is written in a way that challenges us and continues to challenge us. A number of years ago, I preached a sermon. And after the sermon one of the members came up to me and was talking to me about the lesson, the sermon I preached, and said, Mike, how long did it take you to put that sermon together? And I thought for a second, I said, well, two, years and tw uh, two, two hours and 20 years. The two hours to put it together, 20 years, I wasn't prepared to preach it years before that. Over time, through the studies, I began to understand some things, and I got confident enough through examining the scriptures and various aspects and tying it together, so the two hours to put it together, but it was 20 years in preparation. It requires us to continually put forth the effort. We never get to the point that we are say, I can close this up because I got it all mastered. I can set it aside. We're st constantly having to study his word and his will. When you look at the last one here, we have to teach it. The last one in the context of what is our attitude and approach to the Bible teach it. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. The commission that was given, we call the Great Commission. Jesus talking to the apostles. After he talks about all his authority and he says to go into all the world, make disciples in every nation, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. The teaching of it. I have to apply it and I have to teach it. All Christians have an obligation to the extent of their ability, knowledge, to teach God's word. None of are exempted from that. Every single Christian, even the babe in Christ, can tell others what they need to do to be saved. We all have a duty to teach God's word to a lost and dying world. So we teach it. And then that teaching to inform others how to be saved, what they need to do to come out of sin into Christ. We also then see the teaching, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever commanded you. So the teaching continues. It's ongoing to teach those things that now that I'm a child of God, what I need to do to be a faithful child, to continue to be a faithful child of God, to continue to serve Him rightly and correctly. That's an ongoing endeavor. And again, all of us have that responsibility. According to what the Scriptures give us, you know, there are some restrictions that are set forth. As the Word of God it designates certain ones that are to publicly communicate God's Word, men. But even women have to teach. They're to teach the younger women. They're to teach their friends and their neighbors about the Word of God, all Christians. Because in Acts 8 and verse 4, when their persecution came upon the church, they went everywhere from Jerusalem preaching the Word. They went about preaching His Word. This was something that all Christians did. 
and all we're involved in. So read it, study it, meditate on it, apply it, teach it. That's, that's what we need to be doing with the Word of God. And, and it shouldn't be a hard endeavor because we should be excited about that. You know, I cannot apply what I do not understand, and I cannot teach what I do not know. And here's God's mind revealed to me. Shouldn't I be wanting and desiring to know it and then share it with others? Now, let me notice an additional point here. God is not an adjunct of man, an extension of man. Man is an adjunct of God, extension of God. You think about in Genesis, the first chapter, verses 26 through 28, Let's make man in our image after our likeness. He's speaking to the other members of the Godhead, God the Father, speaking about these things. So what we have here is that we're an adjunct. We're made in his image after his likeness. And that image and likeness of John 4, 24, God is a spirit. So that part of me that's made in God's image is not this flesh and bone, blood coursing through my body. My spirit that dwells within this earthly tabernacle, that is what is made in God's image, that spirit. And there are people who think that God came as a result of the imaginations of man. But what we find and what we understand, what the scriptures point out, is that we weren't, God wasn't created by us. We were created by God. And we're made in that image and after him. So we are an adjunct of God. God's not dependent upon us. We're dependent upon God. So the idea here again, our dependency, where, where's the dependency going to be? It, this idea of centeredness and God-centered and not man-focused. We're dependent upon him. When you turn to the 17th chapter of Acts, there is described there, of course, where Paul is in Athens. He's preaching to those individuals who had all these philosophies, and they were very intelligent individuals, but they were also very superstitious in the sense that they had all these ideas and wrongfully communicated. So we have the idea of his then setting forth these things and, and there and he talks about that God is the one who provided all these things for us. We also find in Philippians 4.13 that, that we do all things through him who strengthens us. And then the last one, I've got my signal, so I'm going to have to continue on out. We're to be, God will not be judged by us, but we will be judged by God. And so we think about these verses of Scripture that talk about the judgment scene. So we're going to be judged by him. So the point is that we're to be God-centered because all these things are true. We are an adjunct of him. We're dependent upon him. We're going to be judged by him. I thank you for your time and consideration.